Is there anything more appealing to a person of nomadic sensibilities than a set of wheels, an open road and no fixed plans? Search van life on Instagram and you'll find no shortage of beautiful travel pics. But do these glossy images capture the reality of a road trip? To find out whether van life lives up to the hype, we took a 2018 VW camper on an epic two-week, 2,600-mile road trip across Europe, heading first to Slovenia via Austria before dipping down into Croatia's Istrian Peninsula, popping up into the Italian Dolomites and meandering home to the UK via Bavaria and Germany's Moselle Valley. The journey was a steep learning curve, an unforgettable adventure, a never-ending quest to find that perfect light. Join us as we find out what it's really like to live the van life dream. The first leg of driving was a big one. An 800-mile, 15-hour stint from London, across France, into Germany, and finally to Austria. Getting a huge chunk of miles out of the way at once gave us more time to spend later cruising around the areas we were most keen to see. We arrived at what I would say is our first stopping point of the day. Um, it's now about 10 to 12. We set off at 4 o'clock this morning. Um, so it has been a long day, but I believe here is a place for a toilet stop and of course to fill the kettle up with some water so we can make a coffee. Which means that I get to actually use the gas burners, which I find very, very exciting to do in a car. Um, Step one actually was trying to get the thing hooked up because I couldn't really figure it out and I'm always a bit scared about using gas in case, well, in case it explodes and I get covered in fire uh, and all that. Um, but it has worked. We have got boiling water. I do have my AeroPress and a nice fresh bag of coffee, which means I get to make lovely, fresh, delicious coffee in the outside in the van, which I find amazing. CNET mug, of course. Having arrived at our first stop in the beautiful Austrian mountains, we hit our first snag. What are you doing, Andy? I'm filling the water tank of our van, um, which is, was empty. And unfortunately, we haven't been provided with the hose, which will connect this tap to the van to allow us to fill it up in one easy movement. So instead, I had the, I think, genius idea of doing it about 50,000 times, filling up a bottle. And then just shoving it in the hole. How many times have you done it so far? I've totally lost count. Is there any way of telling when it's full? Probably. But I don't know how. There's probably a gauge somewhere. With our water tank full, it was time for a much needed sleep. But even that wasn't problem free. We had a good first night's sleep. Um, the only problem was that we did find it a little interrupted by the car alarm going off. Now it turned out that we locked the car by pressing the lock button on the keys, which we thought, fair enough, that's gonna lock the car. It turns out that also activates the alarm and there are motion sensors inside. So as soon as we moved anywhere, the alarm went off very loudly at night, I don't imagine we were particularly popular, um, but it turned out there's a button on the dashboard that you need to press, which locks it, but doesn't activate the alarm. Good lesson to learn. So putting the roof down is fairly easy because if we have a look up here, see we've got the bed bit up on these rods, whatever you call these. Pistons, I don't know. I'm not very technical, surprisingly, for a tech journalist. Uh, we pull the bed down here. There we go. You see the sheet is all crumpled because that's how we sleep. We make sure that these window panels are all closed. And then I move around to the driver's seat and I find the keys. I find the keys, the keys, the keys. Katie, where are the keys? In, in, where your laptop is. Here, hiding behind my camera. Okay. You do need the ignition on to do this, so we'll go. Okay. Turn it on. And then up 
here we have this panel and it tells me roof open. I know it's open, that's why I'm closing it. Pop up roof. Uh, close. I press and hold. As you hear. But Dan, yes, blind open, no, yes, fine. We'll carry on. And this closes in. Keep your finger pressed on that. No one even starts making a different sound, that one. You let go. And you're done. Then all we do, because obviously this still looks pretty messy is pull this across, tuck it in, and tuck it in here, ready all day. Cool. With the roof closed and our bodies full of bacon and coffee, we hit the road for a few hours of cruising through Austria and into Slovenia. With the mountains and rolling countryside all around us, we were pretty sure we'd already found the photographic gold. Every corner we turned and every village we passed through provided yet another stunning scene to take in. As we plunged deeper into Slovenia, the views only became more dramatic. So we've just found this old wooden rickety suspension bridge, the sort of thing you'd expect to see in a bad film. And the worst thing about it as well is that it actually wobbles and moves, which is a little disconcerting when you're crossing a river. I mean, it's a lovely river, a lovely bit of road here, but I didn't necessarily anticipate this. Okay, I think I've had enough of that now. I'd like some solid ground, please. Well, we've had the second night, which means this is the second morning. That makes sense. Uh, we had no alarm troubles, thankfully, because we actually knew how to lock the van properly. As you can see, it was sort of parked in uh, this wooded bit um, of a campsite that we found in Slovenia. The great thing is how close we are to the lovely river, which as you can see is clear and blue, so you can't see particularly well, but trust me, it's clear and quite blue. It's a gorgeous spot and it means that we get to listen to the river all night and wake up and make coffee and it's great. The van's been super comfortable. As you can see, we're plugged into the electric point over there so that we can have the lights on and charge devices and the fridge has been on. And we had the awning up, sitting underneath the awning last night, which was really nice. You see a hand wave there. But being river adjacent wasn't just good for relaxing. Slovenia's Socha River is crystal clear and cuts its way through the stunning landscape, making it a haven for watery thrill-seekers. On the head? Like Superman! Superman! The water was truly amazing, but once we dried off, we had to make our way to Slovenia's famous Lake Bled. So we're at Lake Bled now, which is one of the most photographed spots in all of Slovenia. It's probably the first image that will come up if you just Google Slovenia. Um, in fact, I think this particular island with the church on it is one of the screensavers of a new Apple TV. It's just a gorgeous spot, photographed to death. The problem is that we've come here and if we take a closer look, oh yes, completely covered in scaffolding, which 
does somewhat ruin the ambience. So we're shooting away anyway and trying to get some sort of cool, nice looking shots from different areas around the lake. And as you see, the light's great and we've got these beautiful clouds overhead, but it is marred somewhat by the church that looks a little gross right now. Whether or not I decide to Photoshop some of the scaffolding out later, I don't know. I might not be bothered, but it is a little disappointing. But what do we do when the odds are against us? Keep shooting anyway. No, we go home and cry. Okay. By this point, we'd realised our kitchen supplies were slightly lacking. Uh, we did pack many of the absolute essentials on this trip, such as washing up liquid, but neglected to bring any sponges because we're idiots. So instead, I'm using an antibacterial surface wipe as a sponge. Um, I'm not entirely sure if that is healthy, but we haven't died yet, so I'm going with it's fine. I think we need a new system. It's a great game though. Washing up done, we hit the road with a beautiful blue sky overhead. We had a lot of ground to cover across the heart of Slovenia, and as we drove further into the country, the motorways and main roads gave way to single track paths through forests, winding mountain passes, flanked by cattle and long sweeping ribbons of tarmac that gently curved across the pretty rural landscape. Although the roads were narrow, the van was still easy to manoeuvre. It was comfortable to drive and because it's an automatic, all we had to do was point it in the right direction and sit back and enjoy the ride. Because we had our accommodation with us, there was no rush to get to a hotel for a particular check-in time. That gave us the freedom to take a winding route over the next few days, cruising through the countryside, enjoying the slower pace as we picked our way through the hillside villages. Our route took us through the charming town of Vipava. Surrounded by picturesque vineyards to cruise through and with its tight winding streets, Vipava was classic of many of the towns and villages we passed through in Slovenia. The hills were dotted with old villages, each of which provided plenty of opportunity to snag some nice photos, not to mention opportunities to stock up on farm fresh local olive oil and wine. We've arrived in Croatia now, in this small town, the name of which I forget, but it is very similar to what I know of Tuscany in Italy. Vineyards, rolling green hills, lovely old buildings. It's a gorgeous little spot to explore. And certainly, this view is a shot that I really want to get. The narrow streets of the old villages and the snaking hill roads weren't always easy cruising, but that didn't mean they weren't enjoyable. These are really, really fun driving roads, these snake through the forests and over the hills, and even when we've got these really tight hairpin bends, it's still super fun, and I thought I wouldn't really like driving this because it's a big van, and it weighs several tonnes, particularly when we've got all our gear in, and the water tank's full, and the fuel tank's full, but it handles really, really nicely. It's a proper sport van, and when you put your foot down, you really go and it's great it's so much fun and these roads are the best place to enjoy it particularly when the sun's out and the sky is blue and we're driving through Slovenia's wine region and I'm hoping to pick up maybe a case maybe a couple of cases of their finest produce Eventually the road took us to the Croatian coastal town of Ravinj, where we were met by a beautiful sunset. Mm -hmm. 
Our time in revenge meant relaxing. Instead of seeking out mountains to hike, we strolled, cycled and swam along the coast, enjoyed the amazing food and wine and even made a new friend. One of the cool things I do like about being in this van is that while one of us drives, I get to sit back here and I've created my little editing workstation. I've got the table up um, and I'm backing up all my photos and videos so far to this uh, WD My Passport wireless. Um, I'm pulling all the footage from my drone, from my various SD cards from my camera, from the GoPros. Um, everything is being backed up at the moment. Um, I do get a little bit travel sick if I try and do too much. So I'm probably not going to do full edits right now, but um, basically just transferring all over the data so that I can keep on shooting when we get to the Dolomites later today. I think we've got about, what, about five hours of driving? Four hours? Probably about that. Something like that. Um, I'm also, I am fully uh, belted in here, so this is totally legal. I'm being safe um, and also I get a nice view of this lorry and everything as we pass by so that's quite nice. Our journey into the Dolomites in Italy signalled a sharp departure from the landscape we travelled through so far. Jagged peaks and pine forests replaced the green fields and the higher we climbed the more narrow and winding the roads became. We'd also said goodbye to the beautiful Croatian sunshine and as we drove further into the peaks the weather got worse. We are well into Italy now and we are climbing higher and higher into the Dolomites. Now, the weather is awful at the moment. It's cloudy, it's grey, it's raining. I personally think that this is what the mountains and the Dolomites, this area, is how it looks best. Everything looks super dramatic and moody. All the greens are this like muted grey greens. The way that the clouds all like, hang around in like little strands and wisps through the trees. I think it looks so cool, so cinematic. And I would love to be out hiking and shooting. But the problem is, is that it is absolutely hammering down with rain. And so we just kind of think, well, do we stop now, spend an hour hiking to get absolutely drenched to then have to dry the stuff off? Or hopefully just carry on going. We've only got 20 minutes until we're at our stop. See what the weather does and then see if we can maybe go back out to some of these locations. We've saved a few map points on Google Maps as we've been driving through just to make sure that we know exactly kind of where we want to go to if the weather picks up. But it's one of the things that we are having to think, well, on the one hand it looks great and I think it looks better now than it would do with bright blue sky, this empty blue sky. This is so cool but I just cannot be bothered going out and getting absolutely soaking with rain. As you can see, the weather is absolutely atrocious. It is hammering down with rain. It is definitely raincoat time. Um, probably won't be using the sun awning on the van, but we are in the Dolomites and it looks great. Um, I love the clouds. I love the colors. Um, I love the whole moody, dramatic atmosphere that this weather has brought. What I don't like is that I get drenched and my gear gets drenched every time I leave the van. So I am hoping that the rain stops, but maybe some of the cloud stays. But eventually we made it into the heart of the mountains among the jagged peaks of the Dolomites. So there's the Refugio Aronzo. That's where we've just been to sort of get prepared. And we're walking basically come around this path and follow it all the way around there, sort of up and around this gap here to the other side. As you can see over here, the weather is still shit. So I'm not entirely sure we're gonna get anything at all. So I'm already planning on coming back for sunrise. But even in shit weather, it's bloody dramatic. And here's what you get with a bit of patience and perseverance. The sky's clear, the sun opens up to catch one of these rocks and give us this gorgeous rainbow. And we had to sprint up to try and find a good spot before the clouds come back. But we've got some good stuff. My patience in waiting for the clouds to pass really paid off with this amazing rainbow. But my evening wasn't done yet. 
So right now, as you can see, it's pretty much completely dark out here. All over the mountains, dark, and back the way I came, pretty much completely dark. But the refuge is still has its lights on and still a little bit light on the outside, which I think looks pretty cool. You can't see it at all on this phone, of course, but by using a longer shutter speed, we can bring out a lot more um, of that light. Um, you probably can't tell very well here unless I do that. There's a lot of different colours in that sky, blues and pinks, um, and the refuge itself um, has come out really nicely. The mountains had put on a great display, but there was still more that we hoped to see. You can see, obviously, very little due to the lights because it's dark. It's actually almost midnight and uh, my alarm sadly is set for 3.30 a.m. So that gives me at best three and a half hours sleep and that's if I fall asleep immediately, which I tend not to. Um, the reason is, is because sunrise is at about 5 to 5.30 and we want to hike, there's about an hour's hike to a location that we want to find. So even if we leave at 3.30, we're getting there for about 4.30 to more like quarter to five. And then we need to find like a good location and get ready for when sunset really kicks off. So it's an early start, but hopefully we'll be back here by maybe eight and probably have a couple of hours sleep then. But it's definitely a good night for now. As you can vaguely see, it is just starting to get a bit lighter. I still need my head torch lighting the way ahead. But it looks like the clouds are clearing a bit and there's already some clear sky poking through. So I think we could be in for an absolutely cracking sunset. Right. Sunrise. That's right. It's early, I haven't slept. I don't remember which one's which. I've been hiking for probably about an hour now. It's pretty tough going because the altitude means it's quite tough to take proper breaths. It's now getting very light and I'm still not at the spot I want to be. I'm getting a little nervous that it may have taken too long to get here. As you can see, we've got some lovely light over there and those guys themselves are just ready to be lit up. Gotta carry on. After a long hike, we were finally in position, waiting for that glorious sunrise to erupt and shroud the landscape in beautiful golden light. Except that it didn't. There was no direction to this light, no contrast on the rocks and no beautiful golden hues. Our shots were flat and dull, and not even a coffee in the mountain Refugio Locatelli did much to help our moods. But again, a bit of patience made all the difference, as it wasn't long before some direction to the light brought out some great shadows and contrast on the mountains, letting us capture more of the shots we really wanted. Our hike back down in the daylight was certainly easier and a lot more enjoyable, as we really could soak in what has to be some of the most dramatic scenery found on the planet, with more to be found further down. So we've come to this absolutely gorgeous lake, as you can see, beautiful water, lovely colours, this gorgeous old boathouse here, the trees in the background, and the mountain here that's just catching the last of the evening light upon the tops there and of course some lovely blue sky above it. Now to capture this I've got my camera on the tripod, I've got a circular polarizer on the top and I'm probably going to be doing a blend of two exposures. This one um, which is as you can see rather overexposed um, with a five second exposure there we go um, in order to get enough detail in the boathouse and the trees. And then I'm going to do one which is a little bit under at 1.6 seconds. I've manual focused already on this in order to make sure that we've got plenty of um, detail left in the sky and uh, the mountains. And then I'll blend the two of these together um, in Lightroom or Photoshop later.
Driving around the Dolomites meant more narrow paths, more winding roads, and a lot more beautiful views to take in. It's where the freedom of having the van really became apparent. Any road we wanted to take, we could, and any time we wanted to stop to get some shots, we could do that too. Time wasn't a factor for us, and it made us feel like it was just us and the road. As we hit the 2,000 mile mark on our trip, we came to our next photo stop, the Santa Magdalena Church, nestled in the Italian countryside. We have made it up the windy roads to um, Santa Mad Santa Madalena is what it's called and there's a very iconic church right here. Um, we're basically now sort of wanting to wait for some really good light on it and gonna get pizza while we do so. I've seen some really really great shots of this place so I knew I wanted to come but one of the few things that I didn't really get from the photos is the fact that you're shooting up against this electric fence. This is one of the biggest wild snails I think I've seen. Hello. So as we're shooting, the light's changing, the sun is going down um, towards the right of the scene and we're just seeing the last of the beams coming across the field, illuminating the chapel and the trees around the base of the mountain, leaving the sky all moody and dark and cool and this is going to look so nice when it's edited. Our last stopping point in Italy was the Alpe di Susi, Europe's largest alpine meadow. We hopped on the cable car to get to the area and immediately hit the hiking trails that crisscross their way over the beautiful green valley. What? I'm just being normal. Normal! While the dark clouds added some cool drama to the scene, the heavy rain that followed meant it wasn't long before we returned to the van and fled across the border to the German region of Bavaria. With a full two days to make it back to London, we went fully off-piste, detouring via the vertiginous vineyards of the Riesling-producing Moselle Valley and past another castle worthy of a fable or two, the tall turreted, charmingly timbered Berg Elks. It's surprisingly hot in Germany at the moment, and we're in the wine region, so I'm fairly certain that after we've done this hike up to the castle and then back to the van, I'm going to try and drink all of the wine I can find. Obviously once we're parked up and I'm not needing to drive anymore. And also some find some big German sausages. <laughs> what? <laughs> There's no innuendo you can possibly find there. We'd become used to a meandering style of travel. The VW California played its part perfectly. It had been more than just a bed on wheels for us. It represented a freedom to take our holiday and our lives in whatever direction we wanted. Unencumbered by hotel check-in times or bus schedules, we wound our way across Europe for almost 3,000 miles, detouring when we wanted, stopping to take in the views when we wanted. If the weather sucked, we could simply drive on to make the best of our next location. We made our way back into England on the Channel Tunnel from France, and as we drove the final roads back to London, we both agreed it was exactly that flexibility that made this trip so enjoyable. Not having to abide by anyone's time frame but our own made us masters of our own destiny, and that's a feeling we won't soon forget and certainly we can't wait to take our next van life adventure. <laughs> <laughs>